So here's the big question I ask a lot of leaders. Does anybody think that in the next five to 10 years, people will stay in organizations longer? No. Okay. So then let's pursue that line of thinking. We're probably not going to change the turnover model. They're not leaving because we're not nice. It's because there's so many more choices and there's a fear they could grow faster somewhere else. So what do we have to do? If you know that's going to happen and you expect it, well, then your whole model means, okay, well, let's start growing talent. Let's just not start buying talent on the open market. We're going to have to get good at growing it because it's going to go. And that's why I really believe that the future work is really the future of learning. Welcome to the Work for Humans podcast. This is Dart Lindsley. Steve Cadigan's boss at Electronic Arts was not happy when he resigned after only a year to pursue what he saw as the opportunity of a lifetime, the chance to lead HR for a budding startup called LinkedIn. Unknown to Steve at the time, Steve was at the forefront of a new era in work, the era of high turnover and low tenure, where employees are constantly hunting for new opportunities. According to Steve, how companies respond to this new norm will determine their survival in the new economy. Instead of battling the tide of turnover, Steve argues that companies need to get good at growing talent, not just hiring it. This means focusing on employees who are capable of learning and adapting and continuously challenging them to grow their skills, even though you can't expect them to stay. He argues that the most important skill of all is the capacity to learn, and that companies that recognize, hire, and encourage this skill will be the ones who win in the new economy. Steve has spent more than 30 years in HR. He was LinkedIn's first chief HR officer and helped scale the company from 400 to 4,000 employees in less than four years. He later founded Cadigan Talent Ventures, LLC, where he helps companies like Google, Twitter, and Cisco integrate learning into their work design to increase employee engagement and company growth. In this episode, we talk about Steve's new book called Workquake. We talk about the current speed of innovation and the threat it poses to traditional companies. We discuss hiring for adaptability instead of experience, the modern roots of the workplace dissatisfaction that we're seeing today, how Tesla, Amazon, and Microsoft leverage short tenure to their advantage, ways to adapt in a culture of high turnover, the future value of generalization versus specialization, creating systems to grow talent internally, the value of traditional education in the new economy, and Steve's seven models for developing talent, along with other topics. Okay, if you enjoy this episode, remember to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. And now, without further ado, my conversation with Steve Cadigan. Steve Cadigan, welcome to Work for Humans. Great to be here, Dart. Good to see you again. Good to see you. We worked together years ago at Cisco Systems. You were the head of mergers and acquisitions for, at that time, Asia, I believe. And you've gone on to do a lot of other things, fascinating things. Your most recent book, Workquake, which is one word, you saw seismic shifts. That's an unintended pun. <laughs> but really, you did. You saw big seismic shifts happening in the workplace before the pandemic. And if I remember right, you have most of this book written before the pandemic, and then the pandemic kind of lived up to every expectation that you had started to develop. And so I want to talk to you first about the big moves, the big seismic moves that you see in the workplace and that were the origins of this book. So what is changing? Well, I tell you what, I think a better way for me to capture what I was seeing was a growing dissatisfaction over time in the employer-employee relationship, that there was just frustrations that both parties were struggling to articulate. And what really set me on a path to try to help untangle this or maybe explain it in a way that was going to drive a resolution, if you will, to, to try to help maybe frame it a little bit differently and connect dots in a little bit of a different way. And so some of the trends that I was seeing were people were staying in jobs for shorter periods of time, employee engagement, despite massive efforts by organizations around the world to improve it, was not, it was declining. <laughs> Part of that, what didn't make sense to me was, well, 
hey, the employee population has more choice and they seem to be acting more to find better opportunities. Why is engagement not rising? It should rise. So it wasn't making any sense to me. And then I started to see organizations that had very little experience in a market start to really consume market share. Companies like Tesla's, for example, that creating new industries with people that have no experience because it's a new industry or whether it's a scooter industry, you know, part of the riddle that I was trying to solve with the scooter industry was, which is less than eight years old today, all those scooters that we trip over in the major urban areas, that industry is less than eight years old. And before the pandemic, which almost killed that industry, but before the pandemic, that industry was not having any trouble recruiting and most other businesses were. And I was, why are people running to the scooter industry when there is no short-term path to profitability? There is no one that can say, I know how to run this industry because we've been in it for decades because it just existed. Where most people going to the scooter industry know that the future will be require cannibalizing that business. And so it's really not a scooter industry. It's a future transport industry. Why were people running there? And, you know, trying to answer those questions. And I think I started to get a hold of that and answer it through many conversations, a lot of research that I did over probably the four or five years before I wrote the book. And finally, I think it was reflecting on a decision I had to leave Electronic Arts that really triggered me to say, okay, I got to get out there and write this book, which was, I'd only been with Electronic Arts about a little over a year when I was approached by LinkedIn and for a whole bunch of different reasons for another time, I decided to take that opportunity and go to LinkedIn. And when I gave my notice, I was meant to feel incredibly guilty for leaving before and some sort of expected tenure. And my boss was made to feel really awful that one of her key hires was leaving so soon. In retrospect, what really didn't feel right to me was I'm going to a role that Electronic Arts couldn't provide me, which is head of HR for a pre-IPO company, which was a dream for me, I was being able to realize. And in a way, my experience at Electronic Arts had set me up to be able to pursue that in a way in a very short period of time. But I'd never made a promise to stay a long period of time, and they'd never promised to employ me a long period of time. But that was the foundation with which we started that relationship. You promised to stay implicitly, and we'll promise to employ you implicitly. And let's build our relationship on a false foundation that we both know neither of us is probably going to follow through on. And I thought that's just inherently dishonest, and it felt uncomfortable. And so what I wanted to do is start to shine a light on some of these paradigms. And then lastly, Dart, the biggest thing that I feel that I've uncovered in this growing dissatisfaction in the world of work is that most of the models we use in organizations were built to function really well in a much slower pace of work, where we don't have skill, new skill requirements hitting us at an unprecedented rate, where we don't have businesses that can start in industries that can be founded with much less money and in much less time than ever before, that the competitive landscape is really, really rigorous now. And everything we built around how long someone should stay or how long it should take for someone to learn a new job or these career families were all built for a slower pace. And so what I want to do is start to shine a light. Let's have a different conversation because these models just aren't working now. I want to talk for a second about that piece around norms. The friction that I think you ran across there, which is there's this lie that we're telling to each other, which is we're going to give you steady employment, which we can't promise to do because the world's changing so fast and the economy changes so fast. And at the same time, we're going to expect you to stick with us for a certain amount of time, which we both know you can't do if you want your skills to stay fresh in many cases. So there was a paper I read some time ago that talked about the different norms of different market structures, and it really stuck with me. I looked it up today, which is that a farmer is self-provisioning to a large extent out there. They're doing most of the stuff their own way. That's one set of norms. And then there's people who actually have a marketplace and they are buying and selling and they are entrepreneurial. And then there's wage laborers. And what it pointed out is that if you bring the norms of the market into wage labor, it doesn't work. And here's an example. If you work at the DMV and you decide, you know what? I see a market here for having people pay me to come to the front of the line. That would be very enterprising if you were in a market 
set of norms, but it's not considered enterprising at the DMV. It's considered graft in the DMV because there's a different set of rules. And so there's some new set of norms that's emerging there. And some of it is the norm that you as an employee are a marketable thing and you recognize yourself as that and you have to work within that set of norms. And the old set of norms was, no, you're, you, I bought you, you're a piece of furniture, you stay, right? <laughs> you know, for a career in many cases. Yeah. And if you pair what you just mentioned with the reality that we have more new industries in the last 20 years than in any 20 year period in history, new industries, which means new pathways of opportunity, new experiences that never existed before. If we talk about all these highly visible companies, whether it's an Uber, SpaceX, Tesla, Airbnb, 23andMe, and so forth. Those companies are less than 25 years old, all of them. And they've created new pathways and, and new jobs. And even as we're probably having this chat right now, one of the fastest growing job postings on LinkedIn is remote workforce manager. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> Just came out of nowhere. Yeah. And so you pair that with the expectation that people should stay a long time. And what's happened slowly and then it's been activated by the pandemic is, wait a second, if I stay longer in a company, I actually feel vulnerable. I feel like, as you mentioned earlier, maybe my growth arc, my capacity to become more in control of my future is being limited. And if I go somewhere new, I can grow my network. I can meet new people. I could face new challenges. I could grow my skills. I could work in different environments. I could see different cultures. I could have a better capacity to make myself you know, immune from things out of my control that might affect my employment somewhere. So I'm trying to play the long game. And this is what I try to explain to executives who are just really feeling really overrun by all the changes they're seeing in the workforce. I'm like, there's a lot of merit to someone leaving. Please don't knee jerk. It's that young generation that has a short attention span and a career sugar high desire and shopping for promotions. That's not what's playing out here. I think what's playing out here is we have more visibility to opportunity than at any time in history. And people are acting on that. And they're seeing, as we've just seen prior to the recording of this session, several large tech employers letting thousands of people go. And just as another reminder that there's no promises long term. Yeah, super interesting. Well, and you were talking about the faster pace as well. And the scooter industry, which I think is super interesting, partially because I ride an electric unicycle. So one of the things I've felt for years is that a lot of the skills we have to learn, we have to invent. In other words, nobody can teach you how to build a scooter yet because nobody's ever built that electric scooter or that electric unicycle. And so what certain parts of the population are really interested in is going to the leading edge of some industry where everything has to be invented. And that's the freshest, newest skill set you can possibly get. And sit around for a minute and you do get obsoleted. Mm -hmm. Well, that was the point that I really, I think I discovered in looking at the scooter industry was, why are people flocking there? Because there's no clear pathway to profitability. There's no clear product line in sight. There's no executive team that has years of experience. But if I can show that I can build and stand up a new industry, that's infinite career success and confidence. And so it doesn't matter where, as you say, I can grow and learn something new. And, and that confidence is super powerful in an uncertain world that we work in right now. Yeah, I agree. And I have to admit, scooters are cool. It <laughs> doesn't hurt. It doesn't hurt that scooters are cool. No, it doesn't. It doesn't. So first, I want to talk about being somebody who works in this space. And then I want to talk about what employers need to do in response. So how are our identities as workers changing from sort of loyal soldier to Ronin, you know, samurai, or from employee to entrepreneur? What is the nature of that new identity? Well, said another way, I, I wonder if the deep specialist is at risk right now in a world where things keep changing. So, you know, I think we're moving from identity. And I had a great debate with some friends a few weeks ago around recruiting. And what they said, one of my friends said, and, he, and it really took me for a loop. It was very simple and profound. He said, Steve, there is no such thing today as talent acquisition. 
I said, what do you mean? I've, I've been doing talent acquisition since the 80s. He said, no, I think you've been doing experience acquisition. And I thought, oh, you are right. I've been hiring for someone who has experience, proven experience doing something. And to your question, I think the identity shifting to my value is going to be based more on what I can learn than what I know, because I know my job's going to change. Ask any recruiter today. The job description, the value, the shelf life, the validity of a job description has about a month to it at most. And the work requirements are changing. And that's fair. And that probably always has been that jobs do change over time. But the speed at which they're changing now is driving us to a place where I think we're going to see in the near future candidates being assessed on how much they can learn, how fast they can learn new things and what they can know based on what they already know, you know, what they can learn. That's a big leap. It is a big leap. Is that just a Silicon Valley thing or is that everywhere? I ask because I often get into conversations on this show with people from Silicon Valley and people say, is this really relevant every place? Do you think it is? Well, I just came back from a week in Lisbon, half a week in Canada. I'm going to have another week in Canada next week and another week in Mexico. 100%, this is everywhere. Now, I'm the first to admit that I do recognize that I live in a bubble. And when I wrote my book, it was so important to me that people out of the bubble read it and you gave me feedback like, hey, if this is just Silicon Valley jargon, it's not going to be the product that I want. And I tried to use many examples from fashion industry, other countries, and so forth. But if you look at the management consulting industry, which is helping businesses in every industry, in every sector, in every country around the world, the Deloitte, the Accentures, the Baines, the Boston Consulting Group, and so forth, their biggest source of revenue right now is digital transformation everywhere. So everyone is recognizing whether you're in the software business or not, the technology is going to be your competitive advantage. And that means employing technologists, which to a certain extent is going to mean that people with those skills, knowledge workers, are driving, I think, a real change in the psychology of the workforce and how they're looking at work. And the pandemic served many purposes, but one of them was the recognition that I can do this more remotely than I, you know, management necessarily thought I had to before. So I do think it's global phenomenon. And Europe has very different labor legislation and protections in some cases, and as well as social norms than North America does, by and large. Even Canada and U.S. has differences. But the trend of people leaving jobs faster happening everywhere, everywhere, even in highly protected zones of the world, Italy, Spain, and France, they're still seeing it too. And we're also seeing something which we've never seen before. And this is becoming uh, more and more apparent of late, which is more and more people are leaving without having another job lined up and taking time. And that we've never seen that to the degree that we see it right now. Yeah, I see people do that. My daughter just did that, scared the heck out of me because I've never, <laughs> I've never yeah. been willing yep. to do that thing, uh, at least not for a long time. So the idea, though, that learning to learn is one of the most important skills. I recognize that because a part of being willing to learn to learn is being willing to look like an idiot for a little while. And then while you're doing that, becoming a beginner again. Is that something that can be taught? And are we teaching it? Oh, gosh. Of all the industries that I'm looking at right now, one of the ones that I worry about the most is the education industry. They're having a greater attrition than most industries. Them and the healthcare industry, two of the ones that are like, failure is not an option here. And it is really in a period of massive transition. Do I think we're preparing at the pace? I think we are in some cases, but I don't think we are at the pace that we need to. Listen, we've always known that growth mindset is an important thing. I shouldn't say always. I mean, growth mindset, Carol Dweck sort of coined that term probably in the last 20 years. But to me, that is sort of the connected to curiosity. And what I still feel happens too often, and I'm triggered among you know my own family and my own friends, and I'm probably guilty of it too sometimes, is you need to study this to become a this. And having been at LinkedIn for four years and looking at all the insights that we saw, it's just not true. There are so many people doing something that has no connection literally to what they studied. So for example, 
when I was at LinkedIn, I reached pretty close to the top of the mountain of what I could have done in my profession. And I was a modern European history major. I studied no business. I avoided business classes like the plague. But gosh darn it, I learned how to think critically and communicate and mesh different ideas together and look for patterns over time and really hone my craft of written and verbal communication and debate. And that served me so well. And so I think we have a ways to go to move away from, well, you need to study X to get to Y profession. And it's all driven out of fear, like just the same fear that your daughter triggered in you, which is, I want you to be in control of your destiny and not victimized by circumstances beyond your control, right? And she's like, oh, stepping away from the, you know, the game is going to make you less attractive to some employer, right? We're, we all have these fears. Yeah. You know, my degree is in uh, literature and creative writing. My master's degree was really kind of an MFA. And people ask me, what did that bring to your job? And I said, it brought the ability to start from a blank page and make decisions from a blank page from the ground up. My father, I used to go home to my father. My father was a geneticist. And I go home to my father and I say, dad, this is what I'm doing. And he says, what qualifies you to do that? <laughs> this was his response. And I'm like, dad, nobody's qualified to do this. We're making it up and I'm qualified to do that. It was a different mindset. I'm going to say something. I don't actually know where it will lead at all. You know what I got reading WorkQuake that I had never thought of before is that we have a habit, and this is going to be a writer talking, right? Which is we have a habit, a history of thinking of work as a bunch of nouns, which is I'm going to give you a job code and I'm going to put you in a role and you're going to be fixed and stable. But really what's happening is that work is becoming a collection of verbs. Everything's a something that's going someplace. And you talk a lot about a term I had never heard before, which is TOA. What is TOA? Tolerance of ambiguity is what it was. But what is that? I think it's what you just described. It's a blank piece of paper and being put in a place where Okay, we're going to go into Silicon Valley right now. For all the viewers who are not here, I beg your forgiveness. But this is not a perfect world that we live in. But we have to appreciate that there's more innovation here. There's more creativity. There are more successful companies as measured by market cap and investment dollars than any geography this size in the world. And it also happens to be the environment with the fastest attrition. Anyway, people are moving around faster. And so I think those two are connected. Those two are connected. And what's happening is many people are solving a problem that's never been solved before. And that's the draw. The draw is something's not clear. The path isn't defined. I can remember sitting in many board meetings at LinkedIn. Every so often we would have a board meeting and some question would come up such as, hey, board, we're really concerned about our culture because we went from 500 to 1,000 last year and we're going from 1,000 to 2,000 this year. And we think we're going to go from two to four next year. We're worried about our culture. Have you guys ever seen that? And they all went, nope. <laughs> We've never been with a company that's had that kind of hyper growth. And that was at a time when Google had exploded and maybe VMware, but that was on a very short list. And there were many that were going through these bursts like we were at the time. And so I offered that in the spirit of offering comfort to, I believe, a world that feels really intimidating. It feels really scary, ambiguous. That is counter to our instinct of wanting safety as humans, especially the older that we get and being in control and knowing sort of our situation, you know, fight or flight. I need to know, am I in a safe place or not? But also, I think what I learned in when I got my master's degree and we studied this woman who wrote about chaos theory, Meg Wheatley, and she said, you know, the largest source of energy in the universe is chaos. Immediately when I heard that, I just thought of a startup, <laughs> like it's just chaos. And the lack of definition actually triggers a lot of energy, which provided it's channeled in some constructive ways, can really produce some disproportionately amazing outcomes. And I talked to so many people in startups or even other larger organizations further down the road, and they say, oh, it's just nuts here. Looking for, a, oh, you should get another job. I go, yeah, isn't that great? Isn't that great that not everything's been figured out and you get a chance to help bring some sense to that? That tolerance of ambiguity, that's always been for us, those of us who've been recruiting, 
there's a guy, Dr. Paul Green, who wrote the Bible on what's called behavioral inter- interviewing. And that's one of the core areas that he says for years should be measured. I feel like now it's really, really super important. Yeah, you cited some studies that actually showed a correlation between tolerance for ambiguity and success, which I thought was super interesting that there's actually been studies on that correlation. So I'm going to talk about the leadership of companies, how they need to think differently. What does this mean for a CEO, for a chief people officer? Well, let's use a practical example right now, which is which I love to use. Let's look at the automobile industry. What player in the auto industry is the most valuable today measured by market cap? Is it the one that's been around the longest? Nope. Is it the one selling the most cars? Nope. It's one that actually has 2% market share. Is it the one that has the longest tenured people who have experience in the automobile industry? No, it's not. It's Tesla. And Tesla has been around less than 25 years. It's worth more than Ford, Toyota, Honda, and General Motors combined times three, times three. And so what's interesting to me when I look at that, and this is where I try to give the CEOs and heads of talent some comfort, is have we overvalued long tenure? Is that really the necessary component to drive competitive advantage today? Because Tesla's saying no. And every investor, whether it's the JP Morgans, the Morgan Stanleys, whatever, they're all betting on Tesla, which means they're betting on the future. They're betting on that capacity to innovate which means, hang on a second, you mean the company that hasn't been doing this for a century is more likely to innovate than the company that has? Yes, that's what they're saying. And that doesn't feel comfortable, right? So when I share that with the CEOs and heads of talent saying, I'm not here to sell you on shorter tenure. I'm here to open your eyes to the fact that Facebook, Amazon, Oracle, Microsoft, Salesforce, LinkedIn, these companies all have less than three years tenure as a median among their employee base. Now, that's skewed sometimes because if you're growing, that number is always going to be relatively low. The whole time I was at LinkedIn, our tenure was nine months, nine months, and we doubled every year. So maybe we've underappreciated shorter tenures capacity to deliver new people with new ways of solving problems and new ways of looking at things. And it's kind of the diversity agenda. And the example that I love to use is when we would sit around at LinkedIn, the boardroom, when there was a problem, and it was often, the CEO would look around the executive staff and say, hey, when you were at Google, how'd you solve this problem? When you were at Cisco, how'd you solve this problem? When you were at Adobe, how'd you solve this problem? When you were over at Yahoo, how'd you solve this problem? Everyone was from everywhere. And then if you think about what happens when something goes south in General Motors, Okay, when you ran GM Latin America, how'd you solve the problem? When you ran the GM parts in Europe, how'd you solve the problem? And you've got this, probably they've institutionalized some leadership discipline or something like that. And the insular thinking, I think, is inhibiting the escape velocity, innovative capacity of some of these newer things. So I'm not excited by that. If I've got a business that's 100 years old, that's intimidating to me. And you just like me, we've been invited to help organizations. We want to be more entrepreneurial. And I'm like, wow. That's going to be hard because you have your culture is like hard marble right now. (laughs) And for me to change that, it's going to take a jackhammer and a lot of time. So I think my advice to leaders is we have to start by recognizing that some of the ways that we've been thinking about long term success is being challenged by the pace of business. My thinking about leadership really is that we have to pause and start really looking at how we've been doing things. And the tenure question, and the investment in growing talent. And this takes me to another key component of what I think leaders are going to need to do differently in the future. And that is design work to include learning. That the learning is not that fringe department over there in HR that gets laid off and the business goes down. You have to have new assignments, new projects, new teams, new virtual challenges with other groups so that you're filling your talent with new experiences. So they're not going to be tempted to feel like they have to go somewhere else and learn new stuff. There was something baked in there that I thought was super important, which is that learning organizations have had a crisis, which is that you can get anything you want on YouTube. And so what's a learning organization's job at that point? But what you said is experiences. 
And so the idea that a learning organization's job might be to provide experiences, I want to go into the seven talent models that you discuss in the book. Honestly, we could probably spend the rest of the discussion (laughs) on those seven (laughs) talent models, and I still won't be satisfied because there's so much more to talk about. But let's start there. Okay. And I'll come back to some other questions if I feel like I need to. If I look at the seven talent models that you described, if I was going to summarize what they are, is they're all different ways to make an organization a learning space, largely through experience. And so could you talk through those, what they look like, what holds them together, and which of them are sort of expected standard ways of doing it, which are more dynamic? I think, guys, so interesting, you know, having put that book together and then that was probably two years ago. And then seeing how the pandemic is sort of still influencing my thinking around this, the piece that I, I guess I get a lot of energy around now that was, I was pretty focused on it at the time I was writing the book and now I feel even more focused on it is this notion that the talent models are defined only within the bounds of the people working for you as employees. And that is fundamentally limiting. And by that, I mean, we should look at our ecosystem of talent. We've got apprentices, we have interns, we have universities that we're partnering with to work on a particular project. And that, I think, is, to me, the most important reframe of how we should be thinking about talent models is it's not just a full-time employee. It could be any number. And I, by the way, I believe that contingent bucket of talent has grown in every organization of size over the pandemic. So here's a big question I ask a lot of leaders, and this is another one that I'd love to get into with you. Does anybody think, do any of you as leaders believe that in the next five to 10 years, people will stay in organizations longer? Does anyone? No. And the answer is no. Okay. So then let's pursue that line of thinking. And the first question is, why is every one of your benefits rewarding tenure? More vacation, more opportunities for promotion, more benefits, more 401k match. It's all driven by tenure. It's all because we think it was all based on good logic. The longer you stay, the more confident I am that you can deliver predictable outcomes, the more my shareholders can know we're going to be successful. Yes. Well, now that we're seeing companies that have very high turnover still crushing it, we know that that's not a necessary component. But still, we still have this inherited paradigm that that's what we have to deliver. And so that when I'm thinking of talent models, which is How about if we reframe expecting people will not stay a long period of time and we don't make the job require someone six months of training, it's maybe a month or two and we re-engineer work. And I think that is the big challenge that we're all facing is we're probably not going to change the turnover model and they're not leaving because we're not nice or because they're divorcing us or, you know, shunning us. It's because there's so many more choices and there's a fear that maybe they made the wrong choice or they're not choosing the right one or they could grow faster somewhere else. So what do we have to do? We have to build an environment where we're feeding that thirst to learn, where we're expecting people are going to go. So we're cross-training and moving people around a lot so that if someone goes, we don't have a single point of failure. I mean, how many times do you remember, oh no, Susan left. She's the only one that knows how to do blah, blah. We're screwed, right? Well, that's our fault. And so if you know that's going to happen, and you expect it, well, then your whole model means, okay, well, let's start growing talent. Let's just not start buying talent on the open market. We're going to have to get good at growing it because it's going to go. And that's why I really believe that the future work is really the future of learning. So I know I I may have gone sideways from where you wanted to go with that question, but that's sort of how I think about it. No, you went deeper on that question. And so most of these models that you're describing, and I'm going to talk through some of them, one of them is the consulting model which is join us, then please leave. We're going to bring in to Accenture and then we're going to, or Deloitte, and then we're going to, after several years, you're going to go work for another company and that's a success for us. Second one, and this was the spin-in, spin-out model. What is that model? I think we sort of built that model in our Cisco days, which is, okay, you guys don't want to be in this big company because it's too you know bureaucratic for you. Okay, but we love you. Here's some money. Go out. We're going to spin you out with some money. And if you hit these milestones, we will buy you and you'll be able to, we'll spin you back in. 
because not everyone's suited for certain kinds of environments. And I thought that was just a really brilliant strategy and is a brilliant strategy today. That's the game private equity is. I mean, they don't call it spin out, spin in, but they're looking for high value. If they change this, they can realize a high value. So we're going to take it off the public market. We're going to make it private. We're going to spin it in and then we're going to spin it out again and tune it, right? And so that's a pretty interesting model. It was a great model. And what was interesting about it was that as an entrepreneurial company, when they were spun back in, they had a big equity hit. And I can't remember how big it was, but it was significant. And what they were usually doing is they were going after a completely new product. Somebody inside the company had identified something that was a great opportunity, but completely different. And they spun them out. Let me just say, as somebody responsible for making some of that work, that was hard. We couldn't even figure out, do they have our phones? system or do they have their own phone system and how does payroll and where does the general ledger go? It was tricky, but we got good at it over time. Yeah. You know, I, I, one of the things start reflecting on that time, I never aired this publicly, but in retrospect, I've always wondered, does that model mean that big companies can't innovate or that big companies get in their own way? That company is more likely to hit its goals if it's not encumbered by all our stuff that we have to spin them out? You know, that's a really good question. I almost feel like for innovative things to work, a company has to place a big bet on them and be in debt to them. Mm -hmm. In other words, Mm -hmm. it's not something you can do as a hobby. You have to put cash on the barrel head and feel like, wow, that's better work. That's part of it. And think about when we were sitting around the table at LinkedIn contemplating, should we go public or not? And then if we should, are we ready? Nobody around that table said, let's go public. Everyone's like, no, because we're all, we were all big company refugees. And the reason was because we'd all seen us selling the future in a way to make the quarter, right? Yeah. That number, when you're a public company is a really important number to show growth. And if you're not showing growth, you know, and those long bets become really big gambles and you don't have that heat when you're not public and when you're a small entity, right? That's right. And those companies were not facing that. They weren't facing that. Mm -hmm. I can't remember if they actually had to make it to a place. They had to have product in 18 months, period. Mm -hmm. That was one rule. I don't think that that product had to be profitable yet. Mm -hmm. I can't remember what the trigger was to bring it back in, but it was completed product. Yeah. You know, John Chambers said something really interesting when he was the CEO of a Cisco to the M&A team he said, you know, we're not, oh, not all these ex- acquisitions are going to be successful. And I thought, oh no, John, we're going to make sure everyone is. He goes, no, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about integrating. I'm talking about we're taking gambles here because we don't know where the market's going. And so we might have to bet on voice over IP or optical or fiber or wireless. We're going to have to place bets and we just don't know, but we have to place the bets. And some of them, I don't know if you remember Sarin, which was 200 people up in Petaluma, and a lot of them were ex-Alcatel, and we paid $2 billion, and their run rate was like $50,000 a year. (laughs) And I don't know if that paid off, but that was the same week that United Airlines had put a bid on US Air for $2 billion. You know, hundreds of thousands of employees, thousands of planes, and the same value. That's when I knew I was in the right industry. If we're spending that kind of money for this technology and the airline industries is, you know, for massive infrastructure is paying the same amount. But it really is, it was a gamble, you know? And that was an interesting time, you know? And it's sort of like the Wild West. John Chambers said something once that I never forgot. He said quite a few things that I never forgot and did things I never forgot. But one of them was, he said, you know what? Last year, we placed seven big bets big bets. And we said we were going to become number one or number two in the industry in each of them. And we did. He said, that's not success. If that's what happened, we're not taking enough risk. X percent, I can't remember what it was, should be failing because we're so far out on the hairy edge. Mm -hmm. And I can see that with the acquisitions too. I mean, you were front row Mm -hmm. for acquisitions. So, In terms of the seven talent models, I'm back to the seven talent models. You have the inside gig model. 
are these pools of people who are available to go to work in different spaces? Is that the model there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it is what it sounds like, which is you have a project-based architecture of work that you post, this is the project, these are the skills and people we need. If you're interested in, in applying, apply. It's fairly transparent relative to, you can see the managers who are leading the project, what their reviews were are in theory, and the managers can see your, your reviews and your performance and your skills. In an ideal world, it's mapping people to where they want to go and what they want to do and, and take on new things. And there's, there's a book that came out on this written by a couple of friends called The Inside Gig. They're trying to help organizations experiment with this. I don't see a lot of organizations really going at this actively because it's just so counter to how we've, you know, and think about it. I don't know if you remember when we tried to institute leadership models at Cisco, it was met with, I mean, I'm oversimplifying here, but managers saying, wait a second, you want me to give my best people to Asia, Europe? Why would I do that? I hired those people. If I move them, I'm not going to be home to have dinner with my family. Like there's human inertia that's blocking the sort of transfer of talent. And so what I like about the inside gig is it rips apart that, that oh, that's my employee. No, it's not. They're an associate that works for the organization. And your goal is to create value, right? I have an inside gig model for my team. What that means is that we are a service and we go to where the work is. What's interesting about that model is that it takes a lot of trust. So you have to establish enough trust that when you extend somebody as a gig worker inside the company, that you're going to follow through. And if some new shiny object comes along and you pull those people away, you'll never get that client again. And so the gig model, it's one of those things. If, if I'm going to rely on you to give me somebody to make me successful, I need to know I can rely on that person for the duration of the contract. And I'm still, my team is trusted, but it is not a natural thing necessarily. It's taken us years to develop that trust. Yeah. You have building entrepreneurs model. And is that entrepreneurs who are going to leave the company to start up new companies? Or is it intrapreneurs who are going to build things internally to inside? Yes. <laughs> Both. <laughs> yeah. Another famous John Chambersism, right? John, should we do this or this? Yes. Yeah, I think it's both. And I also try in the book to dispel the entrepreneurs are only startup founders. I mean, we all are entrepreneurial and an entrepreneur and it's broadest definition, I think, is what we truly want, which is the capacity to take on something new and different and see it through and identify the resources that we need to get that done. And I think, you know, that, again, is tied to playing the long game, which is offering someone career security and not job security, making them better for an uncertain future is a very powerful offering. You know, and you free yourself from the bounds of this re employer relationship, right? Yeah. I think that's true for all of the models that you articulate. It's different ways of giving people career beyond the company. One of the reasons I stayed at Cisco so long is that they kept giving me new problems that were irresistible. And that lasted for a lot of years. So there are some traditional HR practices, and I want to see if they still... Makes sense. Workforce planning, job role classifications, workforce planning in particular. Did it ever work? To, will it, is it getting harder to do? I will say, reflecting on my own journey, the most frustrating part of growing LinkedIn was that we were never, ever clear at the beginning of the year, in the middle of the year, at the end of the year of how aggressively we were really going to grow. And that caused enormous stress for me and my team. Every year, the company was, oh, we're not going to be a big company. We're not going to hardly recruit. And we probably three to five x the recruiting over the course of the year than we were told we were going to need to, which meant we were constantly under-resourced, constantly behind, constantly stressed out. And we're a recruiting company. And that was just an ironic challenge. As I talked about earlier, I think workforce planning needs to be expanded into just who's our people and what's the succession plan. And there has to be a recognition that we're going to need to hire some skills that we don't even know we're going to need right now. That's why 
my default is when I'm often asked, what are the most important skills organizations should build? It's the capacity to learn. That's the most important skill and, and hire for it and to it and be able to identify it better. But yeah, I think the workforce planning, I've never been in a place where it really worked. It was a great idea. Let's be thoughtful about this. But the winds of change seem to be so active. You know, if it's a lightweight process, it might work. But if it's a weighted one, I think there's challenges with that. Yeah, I've only seen it work in a couple of places anyway. But this is a particularly Silicon Valley challenge, I think, which is yeah. a school district can see the teachers aging, for instance, and when they're likely to retire and can plan for that. You know, it's got position management. The position stays fairly fixed. There are specific skills that change, but the, but the positions don't change. So I can see it happening there. I've seen it happen successfully. Chevron did some interesting stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They could look at their own workforce and they could see what was happening there. But I've never seen it happen in faster paced companies. And I'll bet most of the time, even Chevron got it wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've heard Shell was really exceptionally good at that. Obviously, we, we know folks who worked at GE that came to Cisco and they seem to have a, some really good rigor around some of the processes. Uh, we just never could make them work at Cisco. <laughs> <laughs> well, and it might actually be a liability. Mm -hmm. If you actually follow the work for first plan and it's wrong, you know, yeah, it's steering you the wrong direction. Okay, now I'm going to hop around a little bit. All right, great. About the role of the manager in this environment, military strategist Sun Tzu recommended not using mercenaries. And he quoted a different military strategy book that said the nominal strength of mercenary troops may be 100,000, but their real value will not be more than half that figure. And so I have a couple of questions about the idea of mercenaries. One of them is, you quoted somebody, and I can't remember who it was, who said, when you care about somebody deeply, I think you care about their whole career. Mike Gamson. You don't just care about what they can do for me in this job right here. There's a conflict here, which is it's hard to care for somebody who's mercenary. So if somebody comes into the company and I feel like they're just in it for them, I don't know. I don't know where to go with that question, to tell you the truth. I just feel like there's a level of commitment that a manager should feel toward their team. And it's harder to feel that level of commitment when the team doesn't return it. Well, I have a couple thoughts on this topic. And it stemmed from a few conversations I've had with some leaders recently. It was around resources. And I was challenging the notion that they needed to hire employees and that maybe some mercenary temps and contractors would help. And they said, well, Steve, they're really kind of messed up with our messing with our culture. They're not in it for the long haul. They're just short timers. And it's really kind of polluting our culture. And I said, well, how's your culture when all your team is doing the work of three people right now? I agree with you. It's not going to be an easy solve. But I've, most of the teams I've worked with have always had a patchwork. And by the way, I also, and I've said this to a couple of people who've been facing the problem that you're talking about, I've had many times in my career where someone on the team had to go out on a leave for whatever reason. We bring in a temp and they absolutely blow us away to the point where we thought the person going on leave, oh my gosh, how are we ever going to get through it? Wait a second. This person just coming in off the street is so amazing. And so sometimes it's an interesting shift to get a, some new talent in there. But I, I think that's not going to slow down, you know, honestly, Dart, I don't know how you feel about it, but I think we're going to have to learn how to do this better. Well, the mercenaries I was thinking of too are not just professional mercenaries, which is consultants or temps or something like that. But it's actually the fact that somebody comes and works for two years and is like, yes, you've given me everything you can. Thank you. Bye. Mm -hmm. I will tell you, I feel that more strongly toward leaders than I do toward individual contributors. I expect leaders to stick around. <laughs> yeah. Having coached people at CEO levels all the way down to temps and receptionists and so forth, Everyone has a boss. Everyone has frustrations. And because someone is in a position of authority, doesn't mitigate sometimes some of the frustrations that they have or their sense of feeling 
undervalued, underappreciated, maybe even underpaid. It may surprise some of the listeners to know that it's been rare that I work for a CEO who really didn't think about their compensation the same way an entry level person thought about, hey, you look at so and so over there running that company. I, I, we're, I'm making a bigger impact than they are. Like, you know, can you tell the board, you know, hey, I need to be paid fair? It's like, it's a sense of fairness, right? And it never stops. You know, if you think you're going to be fine with your comp when you get to say, no, you won't, because you're going to be comparing yourself to other people. But, you know, I'm not trying to defend, you know, leaders for, for doing that. I just, I found that they're facing a, a portfolio of frustrations and challenges that everyone is. And I hear you around seeing things through. One of the interesting things that I've discovered, and this was at Cisco, we discovered post-acquisition, we would look at retention was really important, you know, because we're buying talent. We're not buying what they were making. We're buying the next generation of what they could make. So keeping them for a few seasons of development was really important. And we stumbled upon a really interesting insight that the time an engineer is most likely to leave is at the completion of a project. There's a sense, in, and I think you're owning, you're, you're speaking to that a little bit and how you're expressing this, like, hey, we're not done. You had a sort of an implicit ethical commitment to us and you broke that. And you may have a deal with the company, but you have a deal with us too, you know, and we expected more. So one of the ways to avoid that potential point of failure is to always introduce the next project months before the current one's done, right? So you've got getting people excited about it. But yeah, I hear you on that. That makes sense. And by the way, the next project is the new slice of pie that's got the interesting problem. And so there's one thing, which is the sense of duty, which is I can't leave until I've seen this through and I finish this project. But then the second thing is, oh, there's another piece of pie over there. And so I'm going to follow that. I think both of those things work. There's a question I ask everybody at the end of interviews, which is your job or your work hires you to do something for it. What job do you hire your job to do for you? What job do I hire my job to do for me? Yes. I don't know that I've ever been asked that question. I guess the way I would think about that is for me to feel that I'm making a difference, whatever that is, that I'm relevant and that I matter to the system that I'm a part of, that I'm contributing in a, in a meaningful way. That is so important to me. And it took me a long time to appreciate that. I had a situation once I was in Canada. I was head of HR for a small chip company. It was one of the best career experiences of my life. I had a great team that I worked with. I had a great team that was working for me. I had a great boss. And we had some really, really hard times. Well, at the end of one of the a really rough year, uh, CEO, it was the night before Christmas shutdown, which was another measure we had to take to lower costs. We had to close down for two weeks. And that saved a million dollars a day. And everyone loved it because they came back and they didn't have a mountain of backlog. The CEO sat down and he was just about to leave. You know, I was still there because I really loved what I was doing. And I was excited to sort of, you know, get things organized before the shutdown. And uh, he said, hey, I just want to tell you something. I would not have made it through this year without you here. A CEO is a lonely job. I think I leaned on you more than anyone in my life. Some things I couldn't even share with my wife. And I just want to thank you. And that, I would have worked for free for the rest of the time for that man. And to this day, I've told him, if you ever, he's retired, if you ever come back, I'd, wherever I am, I will stop what I'm doing and I will work for you. It was a powerful moment. And I've tried to pay that forward. That to me, that's what I'm looking for when I'm hiring the job to, to work for me is, man, I really want to feel like I can make a difference. And all those times I went for money or some cool challenge, it just didn't work out for me. That's interesting. And I think there's a couple of attributes in there, which is you wanted to make a difference. And this particular difference you made was to somebody specific else's life. Mm -hmm. And it was detectable to you because that person took the time to tell you. Mm -hmm. Years ago, I did a study where I I went to people's cubes on the weekend and I inventoried everything in their cubes, <laughs> which was a little creepy. I felt <laughs> creepy doing it, actually. But it was because I wanted to understand what was important to them at work. And one of the most common things on the wall was thank yous. And people really held on to them. Mm -hmm. 
you know, when they were signed by a whole team, you know, a thank you that said, you know, you made a difference in our lives. That makes a lot of sense. What does your job or your work cost you? And I want to expand on this, which is that when we think of work as something that you are acquiring as you hire it for yourself, you pay something for it. You pay skills and expertise and talent and time. And we know what those are, but what does it cost you? Probably time, time away from family, time away from my kids. I'm coming to this conversation with you in the middle of a very long stretch of travel where I'm in and out, in and out, in and out. And my heart ached yesterday when I have twin boys. Apparently that's all I can make. I have twin boys and they both love basketball. One of them's injured, so he can't be actively trying out for the team, but he's gifted as a basketball player. And the other one has had to work for everything. And yesterday was the cuts. And I'd gotten in late because my flight was delayed. And the son who's injured, I had to take him to physical therapy. So I wasn't going to be home when my son was going to be home to know whether he made it or not. So he texted me that he made it. And it hurt that I wasn't with him for that moment. And it's not nothing he's going to remember is like, oh, I should, you know. So I texted him back and said, I want you to send that message to me again in all caps. I made it, which is, you know, my code for this is a moment. Like, let's celebrate this. And then when I got home, uh, just held him. I just gave him a huge hug and told him how proud I was. But sometimes those moments and maybe I'm, you know, maybe I put some sometimes too much in that. But that's probably the cost. The, the only cost for me is time. When I think about it, yeah. Yeah, I mean, what I find when I ask this question is that we can't get everything from work, all the things we want from work. We want work to help us take care of our family. But work takes us away from our family and we can't be there to take care of them. The other thing we want from work is time and the ability to be with our family. (laughs) Where can people learn more about you and about your book and about your work? A few places. Obviously on LinkedIn, I'm on LinkedIn. I have a website, stevecadigan.com. Which is with a C, which everybody can see because they can see the podcast title. That's right. But it's C-A-D-I-G-A-N. Right. It's often mispronounced cardigan. Somehow people just want to see an R in there. Um. (laughs) Years before I met you, that's how I remembered your name. I didn't remember it wrong, but that was my mnemonic. Right. I have a TikTok channel where I have been experimenting with I call it, I have a series there called True Stories of Corporate America, sort of just little lessons that I've had along the way. And I also do a lot of stitching with other creators on there. So that's been fun. And I'm seeing a lot of carryover from people seeing that and then reaching out to me on LinkedIn, which is pretty interesting. And then my book is available anywhere, Audible, digital downloads, anywhere books are sold, you can find it. It's Workquake, as you mentioned in the beginning, one word. And I'm hoping that I can get my second book done by this coming summer. So I'm super excited about that. That's super exciting. Any hints? The working title I'm happy to share it is called Talent Hacking. And it is going to focus on something we talked a little bit about because it's, it's top of mind for me, which is the disproportionately positive outcomes I think that we can recognize by putting people in roles where they have less experience than we're used to being comfortable with. And the energy that gets unlocked when you do that. If you ask anyone, when have you been most energized in your career journey? Taking on something new and a little scary that you might not have felt as prepared for and someone, your boss said, hey, I know you can do this. You know, it's when you're like, what, what? Or is it doing the same thing for a long period of time? It's always the new thing. But we've designed work to inhibit that from being unlocked to the extent that it could be. And I think it's timely for us to talk about this now because the access to fully qualified talent is less than it used to be. So it's, it's our moment to sort of relook at the portfolio of how people can do things. And we just, we had to do that at LinkedIn, building a company in the shadow of Google, Apple, Facebook, Twitter, where we couldn't hire all the people with all the skills we need. And so we put people in roles that probably in paper, someone would have said, no, you're not ready. And most of the time they were more than ready. So I'm trying to revisit that notion of experience. That's interesting. What's interesting about it is that then the skill of the company becomes stating the problem really well that somebody has to solve. 
let him solve it, but state the problem really well. That's super interesting. Well, thank you. It was a pleasure having you on the show. Well, thank you. Really, really enjoyed it. it great to be here, Dart. It was just a super fun conversation. Thank you. Thanks for joining me for another episode of Work for Humans. If you enjoyed this episode, please give us a five-star rating wherever you listen to podcasts. And share the show with one person you think would get value from it. Believe it or not, this really helps us grow the show and reach more people who want to build the kind of work that people really want. As always, thank you to my producer, Jason Ames at Ninth Path Audio for his insights into content and his high standard for quality. Final note, the opinions shared here are my own and not the views of Google or Cisco Systems. Thanks again for listening. See you next time.